So we're going to be reading some poems this morning. And uh, we have a theme for this particular piece, which is called The Gift. And the reason why we chose the gift theme was uh, a set of books that perhaps you're familiar with, Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift. And then there were a number of anthropologists and sociologists whose work preceded this book and which buttress it, which are worth looking at, such as Bronislaw Malinowski, Roy Rappaport, and of course Marshall Solomons, all of whom were producing books about economics, um, let's call them alternative economics, meaning uh, those which are not driven necessarily by the market. Since we as artists produce things which by and large uh, we're not driven by the market to do, and we do not have great expectations of what the market will do for us, we have to find other ways of perhaps justifying uh, in my case, the 42 years that I put into this. Excuse me? That is distinctly cool. Cool? Cool. I have a long poem called Economic Stimulus Package. <laughs> Mine arrived as an ornate, is an ornate check, duly sealed, signed, and delivered just the size of a tithe returned to me by a concerned government. You have my thanks and the thanks of all poets who paid enough taxes to experience a similar largesse for this token of esteem. I render an immediate report of my expenditures. The check slipped quietly into my general funds account. After careful budgetary analysis, it will be frittered away in various minor expenditures such as heat and light. Our government stimulating efforts are not totally lost on me. I went on a spree at the used bookshop, bought a mint copy of young Phil Levine's Five Detroits, elegantly published by Unicorn Press, paying nearly the original cover price he reminds us that workers at automotive see universal joints as bright steel crosses. Splurged at the record shop for two rearview mirror discs of songs composed and sung by the late Towns Van Zandt, an artist whose passion for stories of love and death sings sweet and true even through economically depressed times such as this. Since uh, a lot of the focus of this gathering was around the I Ching and uh, certain parts of the I Ching, I have a poem that was produced probably 25 years ago, published a little book called Poacher because I have no Native American background but I wanted to poach out of uh, theirs. Uh, this poem combines some local mythology with some I Ching reading. It's called Marrying Corn Maiden. And it starts out with a quote from uh, Handsome Lake, who was the Seneca prophet. It's a rather long quote. The day was bright when I went into the planted field, and alone I wandered in the planted field, and it was the time of the second hoeing. Suddenly a damsel appeared and threw her arms around my neck, and as she clasped me, she spoke, saying, when you leave this earth for the new world above, it is our wish to follow you. I looked for the damsel, but saw only the long leaves of corn twining around my shoulders. And then I understood it was the spirit of corn who had spoken, <clears throat> she the sustainer of life. So I replied, O spirit of corn, follow me not, but abide still upon the earth and be strong and faithful to your purpose. It is not time for you to follow, 
for my message is only in its beginning. These sustain us. The three sisters, twining beans and squash planted in the cornfield, won not only the spirit of corn, but the body as well, wrapped her arms around an old man, handsome late shoulders as he was strolling through the garden and promised to join him in the new world. We see here a girl of aristocratic birth who marries a man of modest circumstances and understands how to adapt herself with grace to a new situation. I've seen those grinding stones whose natural shape favored a bowl, depression in stone, shape into which grains could be poured and worried with a stone pestle. Sometimes worked into exposed bedrock stones which in time were shaped in shaping the process. They couldn't be carried away during the dispersion and must have been sorely missed. The yielding rests upon the heart. Corn and wind, dance of yielding leaves, stalks leaning and shower of pollen. If heaven and earth do not unite, all creatures fail to prosper. The union of heaven and earth is the origin of the whole of nature. We store our grain in the earth in pits we dig with stone hoes and antler picks. We fill the bottom with gravel, line it with hemlock bark and a fabric woven of blue stem grass, then pour in the she dry shelled corn. A woven lid of hemlock and blue stem keep it safe. Letting go the plow with a sigh, I wrote these poems to console myself in my labors. Perhaps in years to come the harvest will be such that I can forget the hard work I put into it, wrote the poet Suchet in exile. Helped out by farmers in the district who loaned tools and seed, advised him, he bowed his thanks. I won't forget you when my belly's full. Not just a woman, but a lady, <laughs> excuse me, not just a woman or a lady, but a damsel, forever young and lovely, whom he meets in the autumn of his life, aware of the coming end and having died and been reborn once already. Out of kindness the old man sends her back, she whose duty is our sustenance, we children and women, his gift, her gift, abiding among us. I won't forget you when my belly's full, not empty either. Now to taste something new. We are dealing here with reminiscence of matriarchal times. In my dream, the flesh is firm and real as can be. In my dream, I have grown old. The woman's body and mind fit, though she is very young. It is the body of the child. It is the body of the mother. It is the body of the sustainer. It is the body of the mate. It is the body. It is the body, ground on stone, shaped and baked, cut and consumed. It is the body. It is the belly, full and empty, which pulls me through this dream we call life. Now, uh, in a couple hours, we're going to go over to Bear Hill and to Clark Gully, which is a place revered by the Seneca people, as where they say they came out of the earth, they came from another world to this one. Here are two poems set on Bear Hill. Bear Hill by Starlight. To get to Bear Hill, look for that dark spot on the map. You may walk up a rough road into sunlight reflected from clouds, but once the darkness comes, a fire is set and roars into the night. At the call to dance, there's a ring or two around the dying fire. When we stumble down, feeling with our feet for the dark path, we follow that stream of stars. And uh, give and take. With a single straight arm gesture, you throw stars into the sky, across the heavens, they stick and glow. 
Walking beneath, we stumble crossing the tracks, look up into the fields of light, already inventing characters and a story to tell them. When you withdraw, take back the embrace, fully shared, released, my body begins rising into the stars. Now, Ezra Pound plays an important role in the gift. There's a next to the last chapter. It's about Pound's economics, which of course he disgraced himself with. And we could all do the same, of course. None of us are economists, and we really don't know how those things work, <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> this poem's called Inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> it's about pound, at least in part. It starts out being about pound. Inevitable. His father worked at the mint, pressing U.S. dollars and cents. His own name, a standard measure of weight and currency, attended a college named for Hamilton, inventor of American banks, and became a money nut spewing hate on those who control the currency and let money for gain. Captured, he was caged and pressured to confess his counterfeit thoughts, but produced instead, what thou lovest well remains. He coined each candle as if it were cash to be tried between the teeth and discovered much too late after seeing petals on a wet black bow. It was all metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> End of stanza. <laughs> Poets deal so heavily in metaphor and symbol that they may mistake the actual for the virtual, or is it really like the chestnut that the best manure is the farmer's footprint? with a farmer epitomized by footprints farming better than the farmer who leaves none, not even symbolically present on his farm. The truth is that in cloudy soil, seeds will sprout first and best in ground broken by the farmer's boots. The dump truck and flatbed trailer have no escort their tailgate proclaims a wide load trundling down the highway. Loaded on the flatbed, its tracks caked with mud, arm fully extended and exposed, piston spotless. Two yard bucket yawning, not clean but empty. The chained mas machine curled into a fetal position, much like sleep rests the Samsung backhoe. The load is bound for another project where the roused backhoe will snort diesel smoke and reach to take a big bite out of the landscape. In my garden's clumpy soil, work too soon or too wet, after planting by hand a block of ten rows of sweet corn, my feet walk heel to toe along the rows, treading corn kernels into the dust so that come rain everything is satisfactual. <laughs> yeah. Morning at the nursing home. In the closed air there is the smell of food that she has rejected for days. Someone shuffles past in a house coat and slippers pushing a walker like a plow. She has not risen for weeks and reclines in a hospital bed, head elevated and surrounded by clean white linens, her face on the pillow turned to the wall, her breathing labors as it has for days, sometimes pausing a few beats before going on, her mouth so slack she can no longer swallow food, drink, or medicine. They tell us 
she hears us profess our love when they place a morsel of ease under her speechless tongue. I'll end with this one. I've labored with my name <coughs> now for 65 years. This poem's called my name. And it's been a subject of considerable uh, misunderstanding, including on my part. My name it is long on the lips and heavy on the tongue. I've carried it these years as best I can since my father gave it to me. It is common in Poland's mouth and on the south sides of Chicago and Buffalo. My mother's family hated the name, putting me in a pickle. How many times have I spelled it out? Those listening frown as if it cost them something. Only once did someone say, that's a lovely name, and only Marvin insisted on pronouncing it correctly. But then, I come from a country of long names, some of them in language not foreign at all. Canandaigua, Tanawanda, Cataratus, Ganondigan. Just sound it up. <laughs>